Hell, in the field of astrobiology today has really been exploding and with all new ways of, uh, of, um, of trying to apprehend is there life and what kind of life in the universe from on the one hand, the James Webb telescope which is able to, which will be able to discern the atmosphere of different exoplanets mm -hmm. to attempts to find um, non-electromagnetic signatures of alien life in very interesting and unique forms. Um, so as this, this uh, project begins to develop in astrobiology uh, as a human endeavor, what can philosophy, and specifically the philosophy of biology, bring to an, to an understanding of astrobiology and the search for, for extraterrestrial intelligence? It is so interesting that philosophers are very coy about extraterrestrials. I was, uh, a few months ago, I was at a conference and a grad student confided in me like, probably my weirdest belief is that I think that there are aliens, space aliens, and don't tell anyone this, that they've visited Earth. <laughs> like he didn't want to lose out on any jobs because of this view. And I thought it's so interesting that now he went on record saying that this is such a weird thing to believe because philosophers absolutely were on board with alien life. So actually it started around Basically, you have to go all the way back to Copernicus, where uh, you have the heliocentrism. And heliocentrism just literally says the sun is at the center of the world. But then it was clear that the world, the solar system, is just one of many, as they called it, worlds. So you had Giordano Bruno, who I think uh, generally is seen as the first person to draw out the full implications of this. And he would look out and say, there's many solar systems, like all those stars, they're all solar systems. And there's alien life, potentially, in many of them. Now, that wasn't why he was burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he had so many heretical ideas. But it was surely one of his many unconventional ideas. But if we go a little bit later, we look at philosophers such as uh, Bernard de Fontenelle, French philosopher. So he has a book, a very, very popular popularizing book about conversations on the plurality of worlds, mm -hmm. where you have basically, you have two people and they're talking, uh, they're talking about there must be alien life. And at some point they're saying, yeah, just like, you know, we haven't yet met the Australians, so this was in 1686, <laughs> but we will one day, unfortunately for bad consequences for the Australian indigenous people, but mm -hmm. they were thinking like, we will meet them one day, and similarly, we will meet aliens. And they thought the, the solar system is filled with space aliens, and, you know, those distant stars, they might have planets, right? So this was a very common idea. So Kant, in 1755, mm. wrote a book about... Uh, the nebula hypothesis. So he hypothesized that the nebula you see in the distance, that they are really galaxies. Mm. And that was actually his innovation, 1755, and it took until the early 20th century, right. yeah, with telescopes, because Kant was just looking at it and thinking, yeah, it could just be, you know, like space dust, mm. or it could be galaxies. I'm saying these are galaxies because it's such a beautiful hypothesis. Mm. So he said, it is sublime, the idea to think that there are all these different solar systems and that there is a life on these solar systems is just such a beautiful idea. Mm. That's why I choose this idea. Mm. Well, that was not the only reason, but that was one reason why he chose that idea. So Kant was very much on board with, you know, he, he said, it's not the case that mm. every planet in our solar system is going to have life, but several will, he thought. Mm. But then, you go several centuries ahead, and even though all these things have borne out, so Kant was right, the nebulae really are galaxies, that at the same time it feels sort of alone, right? So maybe it's because we, we haven't seen anything concrete, and maybe hopefully we will make better guesses about what's going on, uh, that philosophers are a bit hesitant to talk about it, but I think they shouldn't, because it's such, a, such an interesting topic, and there's a rich philosophical tradition to draw on. Mm. Uh, didn't you have a quote by Blaise Pascal uh, in that paper, which was actually very moved me because that was the first philosophical uh, uh, idea that that affected me as a, as a teenager? Something like the uh, the uh, eternal silence of the infinite spaces scares me. Yeah. It frightens me. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that, uh, uh, and yeah. it did. And when I read that, I, I was frightened. Yes, he was frightened, and I think. 
this is a feeling, and it comes almost out of nowhere, although elsewhere in Pascal's thoughts, you have this beautiful thing about the humans that are squeezed, he says, between two infinities, the infinity of the tiny. So at that point, we are just at the beginning, we're in the 17th century, uh, of microscopes. Microscopes were being mm. developed and telescopes <laughs> were being developed. So you mm. have humans squeezed between the tiny mm. and the big. So you have these, you've seen those documentaries where, you know, the powers of 10, where you sort of right. zoom in and zoom out. So he talks about that and then these infinite spaces, the silence of them frightens him. And I was reminded of William Shatner who went up to space recently, so not deep space, but just sort of look. And he thought that he would feel happy, that he would feel interconnected, but he felt frightened when he saw the earth and the fragility of it, like this little little spot it is maybe all we have. And that's sort of like cosmic horror. So this sense, a sort of sense of sublimity at the great and vast unknown. And maybe indeed the thought, imagine if we're all alone, I hope not. That is a horrific thought. So I, I think maybe that is one of the things that plays in Pascal's mm. mind. But the other thing is just that you are basically pushed mm. out of this thing where you're thinking, you know, what matters is, is me uh, in a very sort of concrete mm. way, you know, because the universe is so vast. Either way, to me, is, is, is both frightening and exhilarating, whether we're alone or not alone. Each one has its own um, exhilaration to it. Uh, different responsibilities, different reactions, of course, um, but it's, it's one of the, what I would call it, one of the ultimate questions. Yes, I feel like there's a sense of hope in. When you look at the 17th, 18th century authors, they had a sense of optimism, of cosmopolitanism, mm. like we are, we are citizens of the cosmos. I think that's what comes with the idea that there's many, many other alien species. Like we are citizens of the cosmos. Now you don't necessarily have to go that way and see in Liu's book, uh, you know, the three body problem and the mm -hmm. whole thing. Like, that's a very sort of, the way that he looks at it is really creepy, like because you, now all of a sudden you have all those potentially, uh, you know, dangerous others. Uh, or you could you could think about so the question about how we even think about how we relate to others on this planet is going to have ramifications of how we think how we're going to relate to space aliens. Like if you're thinking about like colonialism, imperialism, you know, sort of fights, uh, war, which is made salient, uh, you know, with with uh, recent struggles in Ukraine. Um, then you're going to think, yeah, you know, this is maybe not so great if the world is filled uh, with, with alien life. Uh, or you could be like a cosmopolitan optimist. Mm. But then if you're thinking like, this is it, I think it's just like, I don't know, I, I find that a frightening thought mm -hmm. that we're all alone because we're sort of in this really, really fragile, you know, what William Shatner was seeing, this really fragile only thing. And then, you know, if the lights go out here, mm -hmm. you know, we're going towards maximal entropy anyway, right? Mm -hmm. But if the lights go out here, then it's done. Like I find that an unbearable thought.